My name is Ann Brooke, and I am the director of Art Presence Art Center. We are here tonight to experience the gifts of author, publisher, board member for Art Presence, and coordinator of our authors area, and the creator and moderator for Arts and Letters. I've always been amazed at the way Jenna can paint a picture of a character and I can see them. This is so extraordinary and certainly a way to connect and relate to the person. Humming in Spanish is the third in a series of books. I have read them all and I am attached and committed to the characters and their individual stories and find this to be an amazing feat of the author. I am reading now Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. At a point, he is asked about his ability to paint these pictures, images, to endear us to the characters. He says, most of what matters in our lives takes place in our absence. But I seem to have found from somewhere the trick of filling in the gaps of my knowledge so that everything is in my head down to the last detail. This is Jenna Gordon. I welcome her. Thank you, Anne. That was great. Good evening to all you lovely Arts and Letters fans. I am so glad you're here. This is an exciting moment for me because it is the third book in a series that I've been working on since 2012. First, I want to talk a little bit, though, about the Arts and Letters format, <clears throat> which was born in 2020, right in the beginning of the stay-at-home time. Our Friday evenings, uh, the readings in the tiny classroom above the gallery were over, at least for the time being. And as the board member who organizes the local authors and readings at Art Presence Art Center, the Zoom chats fell into my lap. I thank Anne for thinking of it, and I thank David Gordon, the man behind the curtain, <laughs> for really supporting this program. We've had great response to Arts and Letters Zoom chats, so why not continue? So check out the art-presence.eventbrite.com to see what's up on the second or fourth Fridays of every month. As Anne told you, on November 12th, we have Dr. Frank DeLuca and friends. And in December, in a holiday showcase, we will present the most giftable books on the Art Presence shelves. Please join us and be sure to check out the Art Presence Art Center YouTube channel for the beautiful virtual tours, art lessons, and the archived Arts and Letters conversations. Usually, I ask the questions during this Friday evening Zoom chat. Without Anne with me tonight, I'd be talking to myself. So after I read an excerpt from Humming in Spanish, I'm going to turn the mic over to Anne Brooke, who has a few more things to say about the Levandula series, and in particular, the completion and launch of Humming in Spanish. I will be checking the chat window too, so feel free to communicate in that way. I guess it's time for me to open my chat window. I can find it in here. <clears throat> yes, indeed. So uh, I would say uh, I have my glass of champagne and I would really like you to toast with me for the launch of Humming in Spanish. As the third series in the Wyman family and particularly we follow Tate, Jolene, and Stevie, who are teenagers by this time, and they are heading full tilt boogie into the 60s and everything that it throws at them. So first I'd like to read to you an excerpt from the beginning of Humming in Spanish. Tate Wyman says, when my father, Dee Carley, disappeared in 1950, I was two and a half years old. All I remembered was his scent. The slightest hint of English leather made me cry. My childhood music teacher, Mr. DeZuro, was English leathered. I couldn't breathe sitting next to him at the piano. And I remembered what I called my dad, D. I remembered that when I was restless in the night, he took me outside with a blankie and pillow to look at the stars. 
For a few years, I could conjure up the sound of his voice, a kind of murmur in the dark of night, his fingers pointing to the sky. But then I lost that too. So when he came home, I didn't know him at all. All I cared about was that he was home. He still smelled like English leather. My mother, Fox, longed for him, secretly, she imagined, for 13 years with a quiet ferocity with which I could not compete. And then he came home, all changed. She had missed a kind of static Deke Harley, the mythical James Dean twin, the soul-surrendering, sizzling love affair. She didn't relate one little bit to this new guy who called himself Deke Harley, couldn't get past the half a brain, as he put it, and the injury that altered his life so swift and so sure. Oh, I know these things now, and I understand my mother more as I get older, but I didn't care that she wasn't all gaga and gooey-eyed over his return. He was my dad, and he was home. And it was good, but then everything got muddled up even more. That's when I crawled into a tiny hole and curled up in a ball. <laughs> Thank God for music, it saved my life. I wrote dark songs with titles like Drown My Sorrow in the Moonlight and Prom Only Means the End of Wonder. I was dramatic, but I hurt inside. Joe Huff says, my dad was dead. No disrespect to Tate's problems, but there was no bringing my father back. He was gone, and what was left to my mother and me was a mystery to unravel like a basket of loose and tangled yarn. It would take the two of us to gently hold the yarn and ease it apart, loop by loop. At this point, we weren't doing much of a job of it. We argued a lot. When I let go of the imaginary box at the beach in Big Sur the year before, I expunged the guilt for letting my father drive away from Sweet Farm the night he died. But he didn't leave my side, oh no. He hummed in my ear, still, which made me twitch and gave me the feeling we weren't finished, that he had more to say. I was happy to bide my time and go back to school and let him rest. Nana, my mother, was chomping at the bit to unravel the story, but she had ulterior motives. So my memory of 1964 is a jumble. You'll see here, thanks to Stevie's excellent journals and a memory like a library card file, that my dad didn't so much die as take on invisibility. You'll think I'm crazy, and maybe I am, but if I'm whacked, so was my mom, because she heard his voice too. He followed us around like he was right behind us, wearing his London fog coat with the belt hanging low on one side. I could see him in my peripheral vision, but when I turned my head, he vanished. Stevie says, listen, and I'll try to make sense of the story. Hello again. Jenna, I, I have read all three of these books and have found myself putting myself in the place of some of these characters. It uh, continues to amaze me how you have developed them all and given me such a, a commitment and a relation to them that I, I feel, um, I feel their pain and their happiness and I can close my eyes and see them. As, as an artist who paints, I find I'm um, amazed at your ability to paint uh, these pictures for me uh, so that I can experience the story. You know, uh, humming uh, is a is kind of a triumph for me because uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later. But when I first started, I imagined ten books. Uh, I don't know if I'll make it through ten books. I'll have to live a long time, considering how long it takes me to do these. But my my uh, connection to the original outline and um, and storyline is pretty much on track and I spend as much time thinking about the next book as I am about the book that I'm writing because everything I write 
has something to do or will change something in something that I've written for the next books. So it takes a lot of crafting and I do feel like I have a kind of an imaginary brush in my hand. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> it, it is painting the picture and it, and it, you know, I read somewhere that uh, uh, someone once said, um, write the story you want to read because you will read it 75 times. Mm -hmm. And it is true. And it's probably more than that, because as you go, you hone and you hone. It's like any kind of a painting. You're just and even when you're done, you're really not done. You, you know, you could go on, but you find a place to stop. If that's what they say about painting. Yeah, you have to right. reach a point where you say, I, what what is it that is going to say to me that, that this piece is done? Keep I have it a simple, stupid. <laughs> I have a friend, a poet, who said that you, that your poetry is never done, or your writing is never done. But at some point, you know it's time to abandon it and move on to the next thing. Exactly. Same with with painting. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about Stefani Awena Michelle. We call her Stevie. Stevie is the instigator. Uh, we say that these books are based on her fictional journeys. And of course, her fictional journeys come from me. And this is uh, starts in the beginning of the st story, and it tells us a little bit about Stevie. Stefani Awena Michelle was born at home in the chapel house on Sweet Farm, in her own room, as it turned out, on a rainy Thursday night in late September 1948. Rita did not ha plan to have this baby at home, hospital births being more popular at the time. Stefani, anxious to get on with it, had other ideas and slithered into the arms of her surprised father, Fano, just after midnight on the 30th. Rita and Fano had positioned the last two items of baby furniture in the new room. Chapel House was barely livable, unpainted walls, unfinished floors but Rita wanted to be in her own home by the time her baby was born. Well, that worked out. Her water broke about 11.30 p.m. while she fitted the little flannel sheet to the crib mattress. She laid herself down on the single bed in the corner while Juana, friend and fellow compound resident, went off to find Jock for the ride to Community Hospital. Rita's father, Jock, patriarch of Sweet Farm, was the owner and driver of the only, only vehicle on the farm at the time. Ten minutes later, Juana returned and found Fano sitting on the edge of the little bed, holding his slimy baby girl in her birthday suit, still attached by a thin little cord to her beaming and laughing mother. Rita took the scissors from the side table and reached over her deflated tummy to cut the cord. Fano wrapped the baby in a little blanket and gave her back to Rita. By then, scooched up on the pillows with her dress down and her arms out. Juana handed Rita a wet cloth, so she wiped the little baby's face and pressed her to her breast. From the time she spoke her first word, book, Stefani Awena Michelle was the first up in the morning, the last to go to sleep, and in between, always, as her mother pointed out, into something. Book, she'd cry. This brought her mother to the bed to read a bedtime story every night. Stevie was born under the Libra sign of the Zodiac, a natural peacemaker, an expert at tactful and diplomatic relations with a strong sense of justice. To a T. Stevie tried like crazy to look on the bright side of everything, but she found it difficult, people being so silly and all. As one of a large family, the Wymans, most of whom lived at far, Sweet Farm at least part-time, there was plenty of opportunity for observation. In both the formal Honors English journals and her private Little Red books, as she discovered and wrote about the world around her, Stevie chronicled the Wyman sisters, their daughters, and the men involved. It's a rich and colorful tapestry sewn together by threads of stories. You know, I, I'm reading this book now, which I mentioned in my intro um, called Midnight's uh, Children. And it covers many generations of, of families and families and families. 
And I'm wondering why you decided to make a series. Uh, this third book is, is, brings a lot of things into perspective for me, but it ends uh, in, a, in a bittersweet way. Now, if I, if I didn't have to worry about a series, I would have been able to go on and see what was going to occur for these lovely people in my life. So I'm, I'm asking you, why, why do a series versus uh, one book? Well, you know, it was my first time. I, 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 by that time, I'd written four or five cookbooks, and writing a novel is such a different story. And when I was creating the series, I was thinking I had just read the four books in the series by Mary Stewart about the Arthurian legend, uh, narrated through the voice of Merlin. Oh. And she had four kind of small books that all are interrelated and you, the story goes on and you don't have an ending until the end of that fourth book. And oh. I thought, well, this is doable. These are about 60 or 70,000 words. I can handle this kind of a thing. And so how it really started was that David and I were in a cabin in Yosemite for two weeks and it was in October. And I had been really, really sick that year before and I was still recovering. And he was researching a book for which he had reams of material that he had brought with us. And it was cold out and I knew I couldn't be doing a lot of hiking because I wasn't quite well. And I thought, what am I gonna do for two weeks? How many movies can I watch and how many sweaters can I knit in this two weeks? And I thought, oh, I know, I'll teach myself how to use Scrivener, which is this writing program that I had just bought for $45. And so I opened up my computer and had my laptop and I started to look at it and I thought, well, how am I gonna teach myself how to do this? I know, <laughs> I'll start my novel because I have had this on my mind for years. These characters were developing my, in my head and I knew that they were going to sew somewhere. So I thought, well, okay, I'll just write it. Well, as part of the program, they have uh, what they call the binder, which is essentially an outline, kind of interactive outline that is always at the, the left side of your project. And you can create as much of the outline as you want. And so I got rolling and I had two weeks. And so I started an outline with, uh, and I just arbitrarily chose 10 books. And I started with the first one creating 10 chapters and 10 scenes in each chapter. Wow. Committing myself to about a thousand words for each scene. So that's about a hundred thousand word book. And I thought, well, if I don't make it, that's okay. But this is how this is going to play out. And I spent the entire time creating this scenario of these people living on this 10 acre lavender farm in Carmel Valley. And David, you could show some of these house plans now. I started with, of course I have to set the scene. So I created the, this is the um, uh, bird's eye view of the entire farm. And along to the right is the Carmel River. And they are on the corner of Schulte Road and Carmel Valley Road. Uh, it happens to be an area I know really well because I lived in Mid Valley for almost 50 years. And, and I lived across the Schulte Road Bridge on the other side of that bridge for wow. about 16 of those years. So I know the area really, really well. So I just designed this farm. This is the Adobe house, which is the main house that the grandparents first built when they formed this uh, farm or took over this farm in yeah. the forties. This is the interior of that home. It'll, so it'll I, be so much more meaningful once you read the book. It's wonderful what you've well, done. And I had to do this. This is the chapel house where Stevie was born. Yes. And then uh, this is the interior. And so in the house, uh, the little um, room on the upper left is Stevie's room and she was born in that room and she spent uh, a whole lot of her life in this little house that is really, uh, in, in my imagination, a converted chapel uh, on an old pear orchard. So, uh, and then this is the barn and the barn holds the uh, an apartment for one of the daughters and the lavangela, which is on the lower uh, right, 
is the studio where they create things and where Maria, the grandmother, has her studio and handles all the lavender plants and th potions and things that they do. On the uh, left side is the little sweet tea room that uh, one of the daughters runs. Uh, in the back is the apartment and in the back on the right side is where the it's the distillery and where the, the sweet farm office is in the little strip down the center. So it helps me organize these 12 people in the various stages of living together on this farm. I found myself referring to it many times when, you know, in, in different parts of the book, it's, it's very, a very important piece of work. It's beautiful. Well, and I, I started out and I did, uh, that was, this was in 2012. And so I started and, and, uh, with um, uh, looking for John Steinbeck, which is how they got to mm -hmm. Carmel Valley in the first place. And uh, in about three years later, I published uh, Deep Interrupted, Interrupted, which is the second book. Right. And so uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the grandparents. They, they she, M Maria is French. Uh, she met Jock when she was in her 20s. They moved to Carmel Valley uh, in uh, 1940. And you don't, in the first two books, you don't really hear a lot about their past or their lives, the grandparents. And so I thought that I would, uh, in humming, I would help us get to know Maria just a little bit. So this is uh, a, a section about Maria. It, it's a flashback to 1912. <clears throat> Young Maria Pelletier, with her art teacher, Madame Roca, and three other budding art students rode the train for two and a half hours from their little village in the Loire Valley to Paris. Their goal, to view Marcel Duchamp's controversial oil painting, Nude Descending a Staircase. The Cubists said it was even too cubish and futuristic for them and rejected it. Madame Roca was curious and gave the girls an opportunity to accompany her to Paris. They toured other galleries and exhibits and critiqued nude descending a staircase. Our Mademoiselle Marie Pelletier thought it looked like a complicated musical instrument. The troupe of young country artists stayed in a grand hotel, ate oysters and caviar, and sipped champagne from their crystal flutes at a small gallery owned by a friend of La Roca. The rock, fierce protector and shepherd, herded the little flock of artistic virgins from the country whose eyes she would open and whose pantaloons she wished to keep together. While in Paris, someone of significance noticed the 17-year-old Maria gliding down the Boulevard Saint-Michel behind a gaggle of chattering girls and Madame Roca in attendance. Couturier Lucille Duff Gordon, whose designs wowed the world under the name of Lucille, observed Maria from her perch on the balcony of the Royal Saint-Michel, where she ensconced her grand self while preparing for a trip to the United States aboard the unsinkable Titanic. Before she left Paris, she wanted three new mannequins to train for the New York Salon. She had invented the whole mannequin parade thing and needed new faces, new girls. She searched for months and she was tired. When she looked up and observed the tall, elegant girl with the profile of a Greek goddess in long black hair pulled back in a loose pony, she gasped, there is number three, Gaston. She cried to her companion, go get me that girl. A long manicured nail at the end of an elegant finger pointed down the street. A breathless Gaston returned 20 minutes later, his purple corduroy suit ruined with sweat. He ran like the wind to catch up with those girls, but failed to persuade Madame Roca that he was not out to molest our Maria. He was as flighty as a butterfly in his purple beret and matching scarf and jacket and pants, but his curling mustaches exuded a threat nonetheless, at least to the overprotective La Roca but I am here to offer her the opportunity of a lifetime, he squeaked. Madame scowled. He whipped out his and Lucy Duff Gordon's calling cards and gave one each to the teacher and the beautiful willowy girl. The teacher continued to scowl. 
The girl, Maria something or other, Gaston reported, nodded coolly and said, Merci, monsieur, and tucked the cards into her pocket. What is her name, Lady Duff Gordon asked her wheezing companion. I said Maria something. No last name? You are slipping, Gaston. You are getting old. She will call. How do you know? Because she had that look in her eye. Maria, this is a little bit later, Maria squirmed in her seat at the dinner table. Her parents argued over whether or not Maria should be allowed to contact this Lucy Duff Gordon person. It doesn't matter what you say, Papa, commented Maria when she could get a word in. Her battling parents looked at her. What do you mean, girl, her stern mama asked. Right before her, Papa grunted and said, let her call, there is nothing for her here. She is engaged. Mama, I told you, I will not marry Anton Grabowski. You waste your time. You will do as we say. Let her go, Aline. Maybe nothing will come of it, and it will give her something to do besides brood. The marriage is not for three years. It still doesn't matter, Papa. Her father looked at her impatiently. I am 18 in one month. It is 1912. You cannot marry, make me marry against my will. Besides, that boy, Anton, is a 15-year-old, pimply-faced cretin with only a big pocketbook to recommend him. He's stupid. He can't even spell our last name. He thinks the Crimea is a primary color. You should be ashamed to have sold me to him. And with that, Maria left the table and prepared to go to Paris in one month's time because she knew who Lucy Duff Gordon was, even if her bankrupt aristocratic parents did not. And I have to say, the excitement and the life that she led after that is just <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. So I, I have read, um, well, my very favorite book in the whole world is um, The Source by James Michener. And I've read it three times. And in, in a lot of ways, it has changed my life. But interestingly enough, I never really identified with the characters. And, um, and certainly it was an historic novel and I got a great deal of history and a great deal out of it. But I understand after reading um, Michener's biography that he had a cadre of people doing his research. And I honestly feel that the reason I never identified or became committed to the characters is because he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in doing that research and wanting so much to identify with the history, it didn't happen for him. And certainly it didn't for me. And I'd like to know a little bit about your research, which just seems incredible to me, like this past history of Maria. I do a lot of research about the time period, uh, the various cities that these people are, spend time in. Uh, I study the streets, I get maps, like I have a map of Loire Valley, I studied the train schedules, I found oh, train oh schedules from 1912, um, I looked up all the popular art and artists and people that I had studied in school and, and figured out who was, what was happening in 1912 when she was making her decisions, and, and all the historical kind of happenings, like the Titanic, and it just kind of worked out that Lucy Duff Gordon happened to be one of those people uh, that actually uh, survived the Titanic by pushing somebody out of the way and getting onto one of the uh, boats that, you know, that and just took her dot, little Fifi or dog and Gaston and climbed on the <laughs> boat. So I do spend a lot of time doing research. Um, I, I've never been at uh, the San Michel Hotel. I, I, I don't know what it's like but I just found out enough about it so that I could place my characters there in a meaningful way. So I spent a lot of time doing research and I have to say that uh, the internet has made research. Between the internet and Scrivener, where I'm able to gather all this material and put it in one place and be able to refer to it without losing my place in my my writing what i'm writing at the time 
you know, it's re it's really wonderful to be able to do that. So, uh, I right now I'd like to talk a little bit about Fox. Fox is Tate's mother, and Fox's husband, uh, or well, not husband at, at the time, but her uh, the father of Tate disappeared in 1950, and in Deke Interrupted, we find out what happened to him. And Rita, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Fox is, she, she's the uptight member of the family. She has the hardest time just basically being alive. And so she is, this is in 1964. She's in the sweet tea room talking to her sister. Rita and Fox stood at the sweet tea room counter discussing the up upcoming birthday party for Jock, Maria, and Stevie. The conversation devolved into running a cafe and its many morning chores. Fill and heat the urns, turn on the heat, start the ovens, prepare the morning pastries, three made fresh daily, slice the bread made the night before, make two soups, defrost the par-baked scones and croissants, make sauces and chutneys and check the salad dressings, check the dry goods and the supplies. Oh, the list was two miles long and the closing list even longer. Fox was impressed and glad Rita and Juana were in charge of the tea room. All she had to do was make the numbers add up at the end of the day. Fox really didn't think she herself would be very good at the service business. Not only is there all this organization and baking, but it's such a people thing, she thought. I just don't like people that much. David, would you let Doug Mueller in? He's waiting in the waiting room. Juana slathered mayo on the sandwiches with roasted chicken and pear chutney for Fox to share with T Deke in the next door in the office. She wasn't looking forward to being with him in that tiny space alone. She was building her own imaginary fence while trying to act all normal. A small 40-ish Carmel Valley woman in a large straw Stetson-style hat came in from the table on the front patio and rather officiously, Fox thought, said to Rita, my coffee has spilled. While Fox checked out the local cowgirl from new hat to fancy boots, Rita looked up, smiled in her most deferential way, picked up her clean white bar towel without a word and headed toward the front door. As they went out the door, Fox heard the woman say, you might want to get it off my pant leg first. Fox looked up from the woman's red rhinestone boots to see how Rita reacted to this and saw her sister bend down and dab gently on the offending coffee spotted pants with her towel and then get to the business of wiping up the spill dripping off the table. Like that, Fox thought, I could never be that calm or nice. I'd hand the woman the towel and say, get it off your own pant leg, Penelope. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. How, how do you, now there are 12 characters that we get familiar with and to the point where we can put ourselves in their places and experience some of the things that they experience. How do you make decisions about their evolution from birth um, and, 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 you know, all the goings on that they experience from that point? Well, uh, first of all, when I'm des developing the characters, uh, and, and uh, I just got a note from David said that we are going to go over our, our time because we have lots of good questions that we want to answer. So I'm just letting you all know we're going to go over a few okay. minutes past six. Okay. Uh, I spend a lot of time in character studies. I create uh, complete character studies, and sometimes I use pictures of movie stars or, oh. or types of people that I know. Um, uh, some of my friends will find their, maybe their faces or their personalities in the book, but I do not pattern anybody specifically after somebody, I just kind of pull things out of my history and people that I know. Uh, I And I also um, take different situations that might have happened to me. For instance, when I was in the food business, uh, this, this woman in the cowboy hat 
with the rhinestone red boots. Yeah, yeah. She really did come into Jenna's cafe and say that. And I was the one with the towel. And she really did say to me, you might want to get it off my pant leg first. And you know, that was like 20 years ago and I'm still <laughs> thinking about it. And so I remember things like that. And although none of these characters are patterned after me, you know, you can't help but put yourself into Absolutely. all the characters because yeah. it's my experience in life and it's not all coming from research on the internet. You know, it's, it's, it's people and me and situations that I pull in and I think, oh, I could use that somewhere. And I remember things and I spent, spent a lot of time just remembering these traits. And the other interesting thing is that, and we'll be discussing the Enneagram on November 12th, and Frank DeLuca was my, basically my original Enneagram teacher. And I have assigned, the Enneagram is based on a, on a lovely personality graph of which there are nine, on which there are nine personalities. And if you really are interested, you can join us on November 12th and we'll talk about it. But I have really begun to understand people based on these nine personalities. So I assign each character a number uh, in this graph of the Enneagram. And it really helps me keep them true to how they might respond or react to a certain situation. You know, Fox is, is, is um, scared and upset and she'd yeah. be a six on the Enneagram because everything is like, I'll check it out later. But she, she, we have to keep her on track and not have her react in some other kind of, you know, flip way or it's just a, a d different uh, way of looking at people. But it, uh, it, in using it this way, if I have a, a problem trying to figure out how somebody would react, then I refer to the Enneagram and I think, okay, she's a six. This is how she might respond. And then I apply it to what I know of Fox and how she might Wonderful. might respond to things. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and then the other thing, like for, for Fano, uh, Stevie's father, he is a part gypsy. And so I cannot tell you how much information I have on gypsies and their style of life and how they live and how they live in the modern world and how they got through. I mean, he... he uh, was kind of orphaned during the the uh, World War II, and so we, a lot of his personality uh, comes from all that research because I don't know any French gypsies, so I had to really <laughs> make it up. Yes, yes, wonderful. Thank you. So next, I uh, let me check out some of these questions here. Um, do I discuss work? Does discuss works and projects uh, in progress with David? Of course, but David really likes the surprise of the story. And so we discuss some things maybe in the beginning, but then once I get rolling, then he doesn't want to see it again until it's all done. And then he's my first, very first reader of anything that I write. So somebody else says, do you often wake up at night with ideas, words, and sentences that get you out of bed? Absolutely. <laughs> I do it all the time. I have a pad of paper next to the bed and yes, it's true. Okay, so this next reading is a little bit about Stevie. Uh, Stevie is the, probably the most precocious of the three girls, and she has been mapping her first sexual encounter since book one. She has been trying to figure yes. it out. She wants it on her terms. She wants no surprises. She doesn't want love mixed up in it. She just wants to like experience it, and she never quite seems to get there. So she, uh, this is uh, March of 1964, and this is out of her uh, pro little red book, which is her private journal. It's called The Sock Hop. Oh no, what a mess, she says. I am lying on my bed, rumpled up with my pillows. Mesmer lies under the bed covers, her head on my ankle warm cat breath on my bare skin, and every now and then, whiskers twitch and tickle. Misty, aged beagle dog, is on the floor, freight train snores exploding her loose jowls. Wonderful. But my mind is on other things. 
Tonight, Farley screwed up our friendship, maybe forever. If I write it down, can I get it out of my head? If I express on paper the extraordinary grief I feel tonight, can I get up tomorrow and act like nothing happened? Everything <laughs> happened. The worst thing happened. The moment I've been avoiding for months snuck up on me. Farley kissed me at the Salinas High Sock Hop. I never should have gone. I felt something going wrong the minute he picked me up in Phoebe, the orange truck. He brought me flowers. All of a sudden, we were on a date. This was never supposed to happen. Just because two friends go to a dance doesn't mean they're going steady or even going out. Farley is my friend. I want Farley to stay my friend. But now it's all complicated and upsetting because of the kiss. If only he hadn't kissed me, I might have enjoyed the evening. But he did, and damn it, it was nice. But it can't be nice, or even halfway nice, because he's supposed to be my friend, not someone who is kissing me. Kissing is off limits anyway, he knew that. And after all that Adam business, it turns out that Farley became my first kiss after all. Damn it again. It definitely was not supposed to be Farley. He looked at me all moony and love-struck, and in an instant, everything changed. Paul Anka crooned puppy love to Annette Funicello, and we danced. We've danced before, jitterbug, the stroll, or slow dancing in a lazy pattern, you know, side to side, like all the kids. Farley's a good dancer for a big boy. He does a mean Watusi. Farley's hand on my back felt different, full of sparks. His fingers tapped, me, uh, tapped the puppy love beat on my shoulder blade. Something passed from Farley to me. One minute, we were laughing with Farley's football player friends by the gym. And the next minute, we were on the dance floor with his hand pressing through my sweater into my backbone, his pretty brown eyes looking into mine. Without his glasses, come to think of it, that should have been a clue. I will never get puppy love out of my head ever. His breath smelled all root beery and sweet, and his hand touched my face like a feather. It took a few seconds to realize what was happening, and I couldn't stop it. I barked at him, crap, Ola Farley, take me home. I heard my favorite new Beatles song, She Loves You, yeah, 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 as I slipped on my keds and made my way to the gym door, and then to the truck with my eyes straight ahead and blinders on, like a horse, so I wouldn't have to look at anyone or see that they saw or knew, knew that I had just been kissed. Farley was all apologetic and sorry, but he was happy to be kissing me. He liked it. I have lost my best friend. And so much for New Year's resolution number three. You know, um, and I apologize for that telephone call i didn't know quite how to that's handle okay. that. it happens um, i took a, a seminar class years ago on creative writing and i know there's that one area that is so important to introduce into your writing which is conflict and i, I you know stevie to me was one of the most important characters um and and what she went through you you'll audience, you'll just have to read it. But I'm, I'm wondering how you make a decision about what point in these characters' lives do you decide to introduce conflict? And, and some of them are so much more difficult or more serious than others. And um, I, I'm just wondering, um, I'd, I'd like to just smack you sometimes for what you've done. <laughs> people that I <laughs> care so much about, but oh well. Anyway, I'd, I'd like to know, tell me about that. You know, I can't have them all in giant conflict all at once. No. Or it would no. be chaos. And, and I have 12 characters. Yes, it all is narrated essentially through Stevie's work and she's writing about people. Right, right. But I, when I chose to do 12 characters, I really knew, and especially over 10 books and about, about 60 years, that it ebbs and flows like anybody's life. And so in that original outline, I did 
um, I, 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 I practiced and, and it's, um, it's, the outline is very helpful because it helped me create the arcs of conflict so that somebody might be sobbing over something and somebody else is getting some elating, wonderful, happy news. Exactly. And they cross and they, they mingle and they talk to each other about it. And so I tried to have it really be like real life. And in the storyline, over 60 years, I and my and in the the outline, that arc goes back and forth. So I have sort of a main story arc. And then I have a little arc for each character that goes up and down. And so the trick is to do it so that it's not all happening at once. And you know, I couldn't just write a story with no conflict. No, because it'd be boring. And, and, and we all have conflict. And we all have conflict. And what I'm interested in, since I write about relationships and, and my books are really character driven, I want to know how they deal with a conflict. What do they do? Yeah. And, and how do they, 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 they carry that with them? And do they carry it in a sack over their shoulder or do they confront it and go on? What do they do? And I've got 60 years of their lives to help them resolve any of these things. And so sometimes they get resolved in, in, in one book and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. Thank you. Thank you. So in fact, and, and you know, another one of those little things about um, uh, are, are any of the characters me? Um, and I say really, no, they're not. But I pull things out of, of my life. And this was another one. And in the beginning, I think I said, um, uh, that these stories are filled, are, ri are rich and colorful tapestries sewn together by threads of stories. Mm -hmm. And the, that first line um, came from a very dear friend of mine who is no longer with us, but who said to me one day when we were discussing, her name was Linda Aspinwall, and Linda said to me uh, when we were discussing our past, because we've known each other for a very long time, uh, and we were just talking about how how funny it all was. And she said, honey, our lives are rich in colorful tapestries. And I remembered that. And and that's how I see these stories is that I'm, it's like building a blanket, you know, and the, all yes. these things weave together and, and some are great and some aren't so fun. So uh, I actually, I think this is working out really wonderfully well. I don't think we'll go over that long. Um, how far am I into further episodes? Oh, wow. Um, not very far, except for the outline uh, where I am constantly tracking the outline because the what happens in what I'm writing today might affect what I wrote or created in that outline. And so I can refer to that outline right away and say, oh, you know, Stevie did this and this in this book and it's gonna change that. So be aware of that when you get to it. But I can't get too distracted by the other stories because <laughs> they're different stories. So I have to kind of leave them alone. Uh, well, this is wonderful. Uh, the dialogue conversations and insights are so beautiful. Thank you, Barbara. It seems like you must insert yourself into the characters in order to achieve this. Do you actually meld energetically with these characters? And how do you create such believable conversations? Boy, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say yes, I do kind of meld with them because first of all, they live in my head all the time. I put myself into those positions or situations all the time, but I, I'm a different person. I am not Stevie. And so I think, okay, if I were Stevie, then what would I be doing? And so, and then when I'm writing a dialogue, I, I, I talk it out with myself first, you know, I'll have a conversation with myself and hear what it's like so well, that I don't have some stilted, um, stiff kind of a conversation. And uh, it, it, and that helps a lot. Reading aloud helps a lot in cre in creative writing because what you write 
sometimes isn't true to what it might sound like when somebody's just having a casual conversation with someone. So it's really important to just uh, uh, stay in that mode of believability and, and sort of casualness. It can't be formal really at all. So this is perfect. This is just perfect because I want to, I have one more reading. Do you have anything else to say, Anne, before I do this? Um, I, I do. Um, the, the characters are unbelievable. Uh, um, I, Stevie is, is somebody who goes through the whole thing. But also the one thing that I notice is the impact that a character's conflict has on the surrounding characters and how you manipulate that is astounding to me because because like a family they get involved with each other yeah. and and have to deal with certain conflicts that if if audience if you read the books you will understand what i'm talking about um it is a a, a very much family oriented uh, scenario throughout at least these three books and um, yeah I, I just um, it's a wonder thank you you know I call it a cross between Downton Abbey and oh. Little House on the Prairie <laughs> Be because it's not it's not British and, and it's not on the prairie but it's a big family dealing with their lives and their conflicts and daily life and their creativity Yes. And I and and that's what makes each personality so individual. One girl's a singer, one girl's a writer, the other one is an artist. They run a cafe. Uh they have a studio. They're all doing different things that interact throughout the day and uh it, it's a great opportunity for for conflict. 12 people living on 10 acres in these four different houses and all trying to do their own thing. It's wild. It's, it's wild. wild out there. Okay, so for my last act tonight, <laughs> uh, and after this that we, we will be leaving you, and this is perfect, I want to talk about Stevie for a moment and her encounter with Johnny Anderson, who is the new uh, editor of Monterey Magazine. And they meet on the beach and he, he, he she tells him in their conversation that he, she's a writer and he wants a young writer for the magazine to talk about uh, life on the Monterey Peninsula in the, in the 60s. And so as her CV, since she's only 15 and she doesn't really have a CV, she gives him this essay that she has written called Humming in Spanish. Humming runs in our family. Every time I turn around, someone is humming. It may have started with Mama Maria, well known for singing to her lavender seeds in French and praying over her plants. My grandfather, Poppy, whispered in my ear one day, can't you hear your grandmother? She's humming to her lavender sprouts in Spanish. And I did hear it. In fact, I've been hearing it for years without even tuning it in. But I understood, Poppy, it's definitely Spanish humming. Hard to explain, but it has a beat and castanets are involved. Poppy made me think of all the times I've heard members of my family, excuse me, humming their unique sounds under their breath, a personal crooning. When my uncle Deke was gone, Aunt Fox hummed, I'm so lonesome I could cry. She didn't think we could hear it. But when she hums, her red hair frizzles. It makes a person turn her way. And if we looked hard enough, we could hear the humming. It was soft and sad, a lonely heart humming, full of tears she couldn't cry, a moan of humming. Fano, on the other hand, hums while he works. His hums are pure gypsy. Fano's hums are almost holy and happy. My father is rarely upset, so when he hums, it's good to rub up against him, like Mesmer, the cat. It rubs off. His humming is contagious, in a good way. 
Bono attracts hummingbirds. It's a riot to see him in the lavender fields, ducking the bombardment of birds humming around him. But he smells like flowers, and he wears red a lot. He just laughs and waves the hummers away. He says the hummers drop celestial raindrops on his head. Dee Carly dreams about humming. When he was absent-mindedly wandering around the countryside, he dreamed of Fox, only she was just a girl in red, humming nonsensical staccato tunes, like fairies tripping over branches, he said. And Uncle Chuck. Chuck's the most vocal of all. Chuck died four years ago, but the essence of Chuck follows Aunt Nana and my cousin Jolene around, constantly humming. Even Jolene's grandmama Charlotte, Chuck's own mother, reported Chuck's whispers in her ear from the grave. She described them as ta-da's and oom-pa-pa's, and he generally waves his conductor's baton around the room. She can hear that, too. She said, he smells like a Christmas tree. And Jolene said, no, grandmama, he smells like gin. <laughs> Jolene was spooked by her father's humming from across the veil until she performed a ritual at the beach to help put him to rest. She released an imaginary box full of the guilt and emotions about his death to the sea. She said at the time, I don't necessarily want the humming to stop, but I wouldn't mind a new tune. The consensus on Chuck is that he won't rest until he has sat, had his say. He lurks around just out of sight and he'll keep humming until Jolene and her mother sort through all that family dirty laundry. Nana says, it's a throb in my head, his constant hum gives me a headache. My cousin Tate, of course, hums in her sleep. She hums while eating, while doing homework, picking tomatoes, riding home from school on the bus. Tate has been humming since she flew from her mother's womb. She says she hums because she doesn't want people to hear her practice, but her humming is as beautiful as her singing. Tate's humming is lyrical, a trilling songbird's hum. I don't think of myself as much of a hummer, but Cousin Tate says I hum Handel's Hallelujah Chorus when I'm concentrating. But she also says I stick out my tongue about a sixteenth of an inch and I put my index finger on the tip of my nose like the answers to all questions lie within. No matter the language, no matter the tune, humming is a kind of outlet, a release of energy spilled over, an homage to the gods, a love note in the ear of a friend. Humming adds dimension to your emotions. It also seems to be a way for the late to communicate with the living. Amen to that. Thank you for coming. Hope to hear from you soon. We'll be back November 12th. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you.